Oh, we are? Okay, so let's get started. Yeah. 12 people. We have the 12 best people in the entire conference at our session. Thank you. Woohoo! Yeah. Woohoo! All right. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, how's the conference going so far for you? Good? Excellent. All right, so before we get started, uh, my name is Scott Klein. This is Thomas LaRock. We're going to uh, give you an intro slide here pretty quick about it, talk, talk about ourselves. But who here uh, is familiar with Windows Azure SQL Database? Most of you? Okay, anything in production, anything, or just playing with it? Production? Or just playing with it, mostly? All right, anybody have anything in production? Okay. So I'm assuming you're, you're here because you want to know more about kind of what Windows Azure SQL Database is and primarily, hey, if I'm a DBA, SQL Server DBA on premise. So I'm assuming you're all SQL people, SQL Server people, correct? Right? So I'm assuming you're here because you want to know if we go to the cloud, what does my role as a DBA mean in Windows Azure SQL Database? Is that a true statement? Okay. When uh, Windows Azure, when, you know, it used to be called SQL Azure, but it's, it's, we'll call it SQL Database because that's the official name. So when SQL Database first came out, uh, you know, DBAs thought that they were all out of a job, <laughs> right? And so that's not the case, and we're here to talk about that we're not out of a job. So um, quick introduction. Uh, this is my contact information. So that's my blog. That's my email address. That's my Twitter uh, so if you have any questions about what we're going to talk about or uh, want to talk further or more detail about what we're going to talk about here, feel free to reach out. Uh, Tom, um, that's, mine. that's his, so same thing, <laughs> that's, that's Tom. And you should all know Tom is a, you know, the SQL rock star, so you know, we got, we're lucky to have Tom with us today. Awesome, uh, awesome guy. All right, so with that, let's talk about, um, so, the cloud. So if you've been watching over the last few years what uh, has been going on, you know that there's a lot of cloud movement. A lot, of, you know, a lot of the industry, trade rags, things like that are really pushing the cloud, right? So whether we, whether we like it or not, it's, eventually we're going to be going there. And a lot of people are going there. You've been playing with it, things like that, right? So we're going to be going, we're going to, be going to the cloud. And the industry is moving that way, right? So, the, but the, as you've all known, and as you're all aware, right, it's like, hey, you know, as a DBA, what does going to the cloud mean for me? As a developer, developers, software developers kind of get it, right? They're, they can still develop their, you know, their, their applications, go to the cloud, they're still, you know, they're still functional. But as a DBA, the initial panic was, oh my goodness, I'm out of a job, or I, my role drastically changes, and what does that mean, right? And so, you know, the good news is, is that's not necessarily, that's not true. As a DBA, as SQL Server people, you're still very, your role and functions for SQL Servers is still very valid. So this is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to focus on uh, some key things. Uh, management and administration, maintenance, uh, monitoring, tuning and troubleshooting, and best practices. So again, this is a paradigm shift because we know, you know how we do these kind of things on-premise with SQL Server. What do these things mean in Windows Azure, Windows Azure SQL Database or in the cloud? How do, we, how do these roles and functions change in the cloud? So before we get started, I just want to spend a couple minutes and talk about the architecture of Windows Azure SQL Database or SQL Database, right? Because it'll kind of get a, 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 kind of us an idea and help us understand how these functions work in Windows Azure SQL Database, right? So I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I just want to spend a, a little time here. The good news is, is that it really doesn't change. Uh, there's just one slight difference. So all the app from an application standpoint, all the protocol work, all the languages work. It still talks TDS, tabular data stream. It's still over 1433 because it is SQL Server under the scenes. It still is SQL Server, right? The only difference is, is that we now have this middle services layer, and it's responsible for provisioning, um, um, billing and metering, and connection routing, right? So on premise, we know that you know there's the box. We can touch it, smell it, feel it. You know, we give it name. You know, when we, we can name the box, we give it instance names like Batman, Superman, right? Ratbert, Dilbert, things like that. You've all done it, right? But we can't do that in the cloud. Right, uh, while well, it is SQL Server, so it's you know it's this TDS endpoint where we can't physically touch the box. So what does that mean for us as, as DBAs, as, as SQL Server people? Right, so that's the only difference because other than that, it is the same. Right, there is SQL Server boxes in the cloud. I mean, there's it, there, there are boxes running SQL Server 2012. 
And since it is SQL Server, it, they need a bunch, it still needs a bunch of administration and maintenance and monitoring where you come in. This is where you come in, right? So it is SQL Server. All right, does this help? Just give you a better, better idea of what's, what we're talking about? So with that, let's talk about management. As a DBA, we know how to manage SQL Server on-prem. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the tools that you can use to work with SQL Database. SQL Server Management Studio still works. Uh, management portals and PowerShell. Who's, any PowerShell people here? Right? Okay. One? Yeah, there's... There's one in every crowd. Right, yeah, there's <laughs> kind of the black sheet. No, yeah, one in every crowd. So, uh, but it's starting to pick up, right? And, and we, Microsoft is pushing uh, PowerShell pretty heavily, and there's a great things you can do with PowerShell. So we're going to take a look at uh, some of these tools. So let's start with SQL Server Management Studio. So... I'm not, I, don't wanna, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because as SQL Server people, you understand SQL Server Management Studio, right? So it still does, uh, it does require connectivity and we will talk connection uh, in, in a minute. Uh, some of the gotchas and some of the things you have to pay attention as far as the DBA is concerned for connectivity. But it still does everything else. It still has Object Explorer, still has a query window. You can look at execution plans. You can look at statistics, uh, I.O. and time and things like that. So everything that you can do, most of the things you can do on-prem today still work in Windows Azure SQL Database. Right? So that's, a, that's good news. We also have additional tools like the Windows Azure Management Portal. Who's familiar with the Windows Azure Management Portal from the database side, right? Yep, perfect. You go in there, you can look at metrics, you can see the uh, connections and successful connections, timed out connections, have, have, have connections failed, things like that. Uh, provision your servers, provision your databases, you can monitor, this is the monitoring, hey, uh, monitor my connections, see what's going on there. You can configure, and uh, from a configuration standpoint, you can configure uh, uh, primarily the security, and we'll talk about security in a minute, but this is critical for you as a DBA, because as DBAs, the number one thing we always want to deal with or we're concerned about is security, right? No. No? As a DBA, number one is being in control. <laughs> okay. We're control freaks. We're control freaks. Well, but it's, and, and control, so, yeah, okay, so, and security. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want to control security. Who has access to our data, right? All right. So from a configuration standpoint, it's really, you know, how, who has access to my box, okay? So we'll take a look at that. And then we're going to take a look at the SQL Database Management Portal. And this is, uh, let me throw this out. How many of you have ever wished that there was a web-based version of SQL Server Management Studio? Hmm. Wished for it? Okay. Wished for it? Okay, my hands up. And th those that haven't raised their hands are lying, because you, <laughs> you, you, you have, right? Um, and so the, the SQL Database Management Portal. I got it. Did I just knock it off? Sorry. Yeah. So the uh, SQL Database Management Portal, uh, you can consider it a kind of a, a, a light version of SQL Server Management Studio. It's not a, I don't want to say it's a replacement of or a continuation of. It's the ability, it's a web-based uh, uh, interface to Windows Azure SQL Database. It doesn't work with on-prem SQL Server. It works with Windows Azure SQL Database. So I can do... Um, uh, manage objects, tables, stores, uh, views, store procedures. I can write queries. I can look at execution plans. I can look at my top X queries to see which queries are running and what's, their, uh, what's going on with these queries. And we'll take a look at that. So there's some great tools up there from a DBA perspective. I can uh, do a lot of things through SQL Database Management Portal. It's, it's quite awesome, right? And then there's PowerShell. Now, PowerShell is, is quite awesome because there's a whole set of power, uh, built-in, pre-built PowerShell scripts that allow you to manage and maintain SQL Database. So I can provision a server, I can provision a database, I can set firewall rules, we'll talk about firewall rules in a minute, I can deprovision uh, databases and, and servers, I can do a whole set of, 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 so a lot of things I can do in the portal I can do through PowerShell script. And the great thing about that is that I get more granular control over my, my SQL Database environment, right? not just through the UI, I can do a lot of these things programmatically and get more granular control with that. So with that, uh, let me jump out and do a quick demo of just show you some of these tools that we're talking about. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on SQL Database, or I'm sorry, on, um, on uh, SQL Server Management Studio, but here I've connected to my, uh, my database, my server in the cloud, and there's all my databases. It's, Pretty simple, right? I can still do queries. I can still um, 
uh, add users, add logins. Right? So a lot of things I can do on premise still apply to the cloud. I can write queries, I can look at execution plans, like here's actual and estimated execution plans, I can look at those. Uh, so nothing really changes because I am connected to my server in the cloud. So a lot of the functionality that I have is creating logins, creating users, assigning users groups and permissions and things like that still work. Right? It is, I create databases through here, provision. I cannot provision a server through here, obviously, but I can still create a database and all, uh, all that functionality. So that really doesn't change. But what I do want to show you is a, a couple of things. Here is the Windows Azure Management Console. If I were to go into a server here, so let's pick this server. This is the one where all our, the, 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 the databases are on that you just saw. So here's my dashboard. So I can look at usage overview, how many databases do I have, uh, I can look at the status, I can look at how, the, how many databases and where it's, lo where it's located. Uh, here's my databases on that server, what's their status, where's their location. But the great thing here is uh, to configure. Here's where I want to set firewall rules. We're going to talk firewall rules in a, in a little bit, but this is kind of from a DBA perspective, this is, kind of, this is critical for you because it controls who has access to this database, these databases and this server. All right, but let me go into a database. And then let's pick the AdventureWorks database. And right out of the gate, uh, I have uh, two tabs. I have dashboard and I have monitor. And on these, I can see several things, right? I can see my deadlocks, I can see my failed connections, and I can see my successful connections. So right out of the gate, bam, I know what's going on. I know the status of, of my database and who's trying to connect and why they're, you know, not why they're connecting, but who's connecting and did I have failed connections and why did they fail? And I can take a look at this information over, you know, uh, relative time, so 24-hour period, uh, six-hour period, or seven-day period, so I can get a, a window into what's going on with my database. And we'll talk about connectivity in a little minute, because this is critical, this is important for you as a DBA, right? Uh, dashboard kind of gives me this kind of this, uh, a little bit, a combination of some things, right? So there, there it is. So I can look at my connection strings. So there's the, from the, a quick look at um, uh, my, data, my database, I get great, this is, this is really good. But let me, uh, let's jump out. So any questions about the Windows Azure Management Portal? All right, so let's talk and jump out and go to the SQL Database Management Portal. And this is the kind of the web-based version of SQL Server Management Studio. And that's right here. If I, if I go to Dashboard and then scroll down, I have this node called or this link called Manage URL, right? Or, or as Tom's pointing out, I can just click on Manage down here, which is probably even better. So let me click on Manage. And it opens up in a new browser. And it is Silverlight-based, so we do have to wait a couple seconds. So when you, from that high level, now you declare your database. Oh, OK. Oh, wait, no, it's filled. I, it's, it's filled it in for you. I can't see that from here. I see it there, though. So let's log in, and we'll show you this. And then while this is loading, let me, jump, let, let me show you these. So um, if you install the Windows Azure SDK, this is available on MSDN, if you install the Windows Azure SDK, you get this link. You get this uh, over here, Windows Azure PowerShell, right? Yeah, ooh, right? And, and it's, uh, if you launch that and type in the following command, git command dash module Azure, it lists all the available Windows Azure, whoops, too far all the Azure uh, pre-built uh, Azure commandlets that allow you to work with Windows Azure and everything about Windows Azure, not just Windows Azure SQL Database. So we can see there is some, you know, remove SQL database, remove Azure SQL Database, remove Azure SQL Database server firewall rule. If we scroll up a little bit, right, we can see new Azure SQL database, new Azure SQL database server, new Azure SQL database server firewall rule, things like that. So we can run these and get, get that more granular control over what's happening. So you can programmatically use these PowerShell scripts to provision, deprovision, set who has access, things like that, and not have to go through the UI, right? But going through the UI isn't bad. All right. So with that, now we're going to the Windows Azure SQL database uh, management portal. And through here, this is really awesome because this is the kind of the web-based version of SQL Server Management Studio. So here I get a summary when it loads. There's the summary, so date created, collation, things like that. But what I like is if you click on the query performance, this is awesome as a DBA because right out of the gate, it gives me the last, the, 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 the last X, or probably last 10, 12 queries that were executed. 
and what's going on with those queries. How many times do they run? What's the CPU? What's the duration? Physical reads and writes and things like that. So I can get a great snapshot immediately as to do I have any problems with currently running queries? Now, a, a quick plug for tomorrow. Myself and Grant Fritchie will be talking about this in more detail. We have a, a, a session called see, Query Troubleshooting and Query Tuning in Windows or SQL Database. We'll be talking more about this. But this is a great, from a DBA perspective, I can say what's going on. Right? Because, as we know, uh, Profiler does not work right now in Windows Azure SQL Database. Neither but does uh, extended events. Huh? Uh, and neither does extended yeah, events. True, neither does extended events. So this is great. And tomorrow we'll be talking about how the DM you can use the DMVs, but this is awesome because I can look at and go, oh, here's the queries, and do I have problems in my, in my environment with, with queries right now? Right? I can also do in here, I can design, I can write queries, I can uh, modify uh, objects, tables to use store procedures, and if I were to do a new query, I can also, if we look at these links really quick, I can see that I can, ha I can do, and I'm not going to paste in a query, but I, have, I can actually do actual and estimated query plans in this tool. What's great is that I can actually, and uh, we'll be talking about this a little more tomorrow, but I can actually take the query plan that it, that it shows here and, and export that query plan and load it in SQL Server Management Studio. I'll write one for you. Oh, Tom will write one for me. Person, not person. Why not? Excellent. So let's look at the actual plan. Thinking, thinking. <laughs> All right, well. Oh, come back. So anyway, again, as a DBA, one, I get a great snapshot immediately of the, of, of the currently running queries and what's, their, uh, what's going on with them. And as well as a DBA, I have another ability to take a great look at, you know, a look at execution plans through the, through the browser, right? So I can look at overview, I can look at design, you know, there's an administration tab. And, and if you're familiar with kind of SQL Federation, if my database was SQL Federation aware uh, on my overview page, I'd be able to look at and say, what are my Federation members and be able to work with those as well. But we're not going to talk about that here. Uh, whoop, but I'm doing a query. Oh, you can just go back here. Oh, there it is. Came back. There it is, there it is. And so let's look at the query plan. So there's our query plan. Awesome. Right? So now we can take a look at that and we can zoom in, zoom out, we can look at the... You and Grant are going to talk more about query plans tomorrow. Yes, we're going to talk, okay. yes. Yeah. So if you want to know how to use this to look at, because I think when I first started using this, it was kind of a, hey, you know, eh. but this is great because I can look at these in terms of total CPU, I.O., and say, well, show me all my latest scans. So it, it took a little bit for me to get used to this, but it's actually pretty nice now that I've, now that I've used it. Okay. So with that, uh, any questions about the tools? We talked uh, just quick about PowerShell, SQL Server Management Studio, the, uh, how to take a look at your environment, you know, and kind of some metrics through Windows Azure Management, uh, the Windows Azure Management Portal and now the uh, SQL Database Management Portal. Any questions? Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, so how did I get to this point? Yeah, so um, back in the Windows Azure Management Portal, I clicked on this button down here, manage. Yeah, so I have to go up, into, yeah. So in the I Windows Azure up. Management Portal, I need to select a database. And once I select a database, like notice that I've got AdventureWorks 2012 selected. So here's the list of databases. So, so here's a list of databases, select a database, go to, go oh, to my dashboard, dashboard tab. And then I either can either click on the manage button down here or click on the manage URL link. No, it's no. right now. It's uh, one at a time. So I need to work with the uh, with the database individually, right? So you could use Management Studio to still view all list of databases, but you're not going to. There's no portal equivalent to interact with all the yeah. databases. So it, it's a it's a one for one. Yeah. So I can still use SQL Server Management Studio because again, there's all my databases, right? And this allows me to do a lot of the things I can do in that portal you saw, right? The, the management, the, the, the web-based version uh, really does everything, you know, everything that's in the web-based version of the product is in here. Uh, but the thing that I like about the, about the web-based version is it does not give me, the SQL Server Management Studio does not give me this. That's right. Right? This is, you know, bang, what, what's, what are the currently running queries? You know, how many times did they run and what's going on with them? Are there any deadlocks, any, lo you know, any deadlocks? 
you know, what's my read writes, right? So do I have any, pro you know, uh, problem queries that with, with problems, right? So that's, this, that, that's why I like this first. And then just from the uh, query plan, uh, this gives me, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow if you want to go to this session, but it gives me, a, a, honestly, a better look at, uh, uh, especially if I have a larger query plan, th I like this better than the on-prem. So are the credentials the same? Uh, yeah, so from a credential perspective, I have to get it through the, I, I get to this through the Windows Azure management portal. So if they have access to the Windows Azure management portal, they can get to this. Um, well, you know, that's a good point. So we could pro you could probably, you know, if you. I just decided to show a different plan. Oh, that's, oh, oh. Yeah, I was just. Oh, there's a good plan. Yeah, so this is good because, you know, let's say I've got a larger plan. You know, so show me all my scans. Oh, I don't have any scans. Well, show me uh, all these seeks. Oh, I don't have any seeks. All right, any... Hmm, interesting. All right. So it, um, it allows me to drill in. So if, there, if I had these seeks or scans, they would be highlighted blue, and I could say, you know, what, where are all my problem components, things like that. So we'll talk about more. And, and this allows me actually to zoom in and zoom out. Hey, right? And so I can say, what's my CPU? And notice the numbers are changing. What's my I.O. cost? Right? This I can't, this I don't have in uh, on-prem. So if I wanted to hand this out, basically, I, I guess you could take this URL and just say, you know, send them the URL and say, all right, and then log in. Right? Yeah, so you could do that. OK. All right, uh, let's keep going. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So uh, servers, you can create servers for free, right? So if you notice, uh, like here's all my servers. Let's go back to the servers. Well, yeah, so they're just TDS endpoints. When I spin up, when I provision a SQL database server, I really don't get a physical box. Because my server name notice is just that, na that name column, you know, .database.windows.net. So it's just a TDS endpoint. It's not a physical server. So I can create as many servers, well, I think up to six servers as I want. Well, or just create a new database. I don't think there's really... It's six, to me, it's, I would say, six and one, half a dozen the other. If you want them to have their own physical, and, and the reason, I think the reason you're asking is because, you know, do I want them on the same server, do I want their database on the same server as mine? Right? Is that kind of why you're asking? Yeah, so really, you know, in, in Windows Azure SQL Database, and we need, to, we need to keep going, but in Windows Azure SQL Database, you know, uh, I, I'm guaranteed that my databases are not on the same box as my other ones, right? So I would, you know, it's, it's, it's really up to you how you want to manage it. Put them on the same, you know, create another server, create their databases on that server, right? But if you want, if, if it helps to manage and separate out things logically that way, yeah, please, you know, sure. But there's no reason you couldn't create a database on your existing server because I'm, I, I know that when I create a database, it's not, going, it's not going to go on the same physical server as my first one. So I, I think the point of distinction you want to make is that what you see here for server names, these are simply a logical name, right? So uh, there's nothing real physical about it. So when you create a new server, you're just creating a new logical grouping of databases. You really all, you, and Windows Azure SQL Database, any one by itself is really what you're managing and administering. That's why the portal is a one-for-one. One. It's because it has no relation to any of the other ones because they can be anywhere. Yeah. So you focus on administering just that one at a time. So whether you need a new server or not really just comes down to, I would tell you, do you need to logically group a set of Windows Azure SQL Databases for some reason? If you don't, then just use the current servers. But as far as the provisioning and things like that, uh, the only other thing would be location. Maybe you need to group them for some reason by location, right? So that's when I tell people, if you need a new server, it's because there's a logical reason for why you have to group these together. Does that right. help? Does that make? OK. Yeah, so either by location or maybe you have a, a prod server or a dev server or a whatever, right? OK. Like that. All right, let's keep going. 
All right, uh, a couple more things and we'll hand it over to Tom. All right, so let's talk uh, administration. So this is now as a DBA, how do I administer when, uh, SQL database? And what, what roles, responsibilities, and tools do I use to administer? We just looked at the tools, but now from a security and migration, how do I administer uh, Windows Azure SQL database? And this is kind of crucial because as a, uh, as a end user and a DBA, we want to know that our data is secure. We want to know who's managing it. We want to know where it's at. We want to know who, who has access to this, right? And there's a difference because, you know, this has to go with, you know, do I encrypt my data? Do I not encrypt my data? You know, we're, we're, we're security paranoid on-prem because this is why we always are doing backups and because we don't want someone to, if someone makes a mistake, we can recover from that. Or if someone steals our data, oh, heaven forbid, right? Uh, plus, how do we get to Windows Azure SQL database? So this is, uh, this is important to us. So let's talk security. <clears throat> I, number one, I could give you my server name, my username, and my password, right? And you will never get to my data. Right? Because one of the things, since, since we're saying, look, host your data in our cloud, in, in, in our environment, we're very security conscious. We want you to be comfortable with the fact that, okay, we're hosting your data. You control the data. We don't even, we don't even have access to it. We don't even know, you know what server it's on. Right? We want you to control the data, but we want you to control it in terms of who has access to it as well. And, and as such... We created what's called Windows Azure, or sorry, SQL, uh, SQL Database Firewall Rules. So when I provision a, uh, a server and a database, I can apply firewall rules to that database. And these firewall rules are IP address based rules. So who has access to the database via an IP address? Okay, and we have them on the server side and the database side. So I can apply a set of rules on the server and a, and a set of rules on the database. And it basically comes in, if I try to connect, I'm coming in with my IP address. It checks the server-side firewall rule first and says, does a rule exist that matches this IP address? If, I do, if, it, if, I have a, if, if it says yes, then I have access to all the databases on that server. If it says no, then it goes to the database that I'm trying to connect to and says, ask the same question. Do I have a rule on this database that matches a, the, the, the firewall rule that matches this, on this database that... that matches the IP address I'm trying to come in with. If it says no, it kicks me out. I, have, I don't have access to the server or the database. If it says yes, I have access to that one database on that server. No other databases, okay? So this is critical because, again, I could hand you my server name, my username, and my password right out of the gate. But unless I give you access to that server, to that database, through a, through a firewall rule, you're not getting to my data, okay? It's important to know. Right. So, uh, any questions about that? So this is awesome because that way, this is kind of why we say, look, you know, how many people are manage? How many people really are walking around in one of our data centers? None. Maybe at one, maybe at most one person because they're secure. No one's going to come in and you know take the hard drive. No one's going to come in and and requisition an entire rack, right? And then there's the security features. Again, we said this is SQL Server, so you're still responsible for logins, users, groups, permissions, grants, revokes, all that great stuff, schemas, everything still works. The only difference is, is, is in that there might, there's a slight change in some of the um, uh, roles, right? So in Windows Azure SQL Database, we have the Login Manager and DB Manager role, addition to the current roles, right? To allow server, you know, security role for creating databases and creating logins. That's it, right? Because this is a, we're now dealing with a cloud environment. Other than that, you're still connecting to master to, cre to create logins. Um, you do not have access to SA, but when you provision a new server, you give it a username and password, and that is essentially like the SA. That is the admin to that box. And at that point, you can create other user logins and users who ha either have. DBO or you know, uh, uh, sysadmin level access or different types of access, right? Just like SQL Server, right? So it's still the same. So you still have a very functional role as far as security goes in addition to also now the firewall rules. Who has access to the box? And we'll see that in a second. Uh, let's see. And migration, right? Uh, unlike on-prem, you're creating databases and, and things like that. 
Now you're taking, okay, how do I, you know, they may do development on-prem, and now you want, might want to migrate those databases to the cloud. How do you do that? What tools do you have to do that? Who's familiar with the DAC framework here, DAC packs? Great, awesome. So you'll understand this, because in two, SQL Server 2012, they, uh, uh, version two of the DAC framework, and they came out with what's called the... Backpack. Backpack, right? So DAC pack, backpack. You know, great naming convention, right? <laughs> we're, we're just going to change a letter and call it the same, right? A DAC pack is really just an artifact that contains schema, right? And unlike a backup, you know, .back file, a, a DAC pack you can actually crack open and look, o look at the contents, right? A backpack is the same artifact but contains not only schema but data, right? You can still crack it open and look at the contents, right? So we'll, we'll take a, a quick look at this. All right, so with that, uh, let's jump out and do a quick demo. All right, uh, so let's do this. So what I want to show you is, um, so what I'm going to do is, here's a database uh, called, no, you're oh, already in the cloud. Yeah, I'm already in the cloud. Yeah. Let me connect locally here. Okay, and I've got some databases. Or not. Or not. Not running. Yeah, it is running. Uh, the log, your log is full. You got a different instance? No, I do not. So just show them a backpack. Just click on one of those. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to just do a, a, a backpack. It's yeah. the same thing. It's, it's, the same. The, uh, it's the same thing. So what I'm going to do is let me just do this. So I'm going to um, right mouse click on like, like this Northwind database. Sure. And I'm basically, let's see. Oh, Tasks. you know what? Huh? Tasks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to export it. I think it's yeah, export. Export. So what I'm going to do is I now have. Uh, so I actually have some uh, some great in SQL Server 2012. I actually have some great menu options here. And you also have this on. I, for some reason, it's erroring on prem. I don't know why. We'll fix that. But I also see these menus in on prem SQL Server 2012. I have deploy database to SQL Azure. It can't get any easier than that, right? One mouse click, done. Let me take this database and deploy it to Windows Azure SQL database. Or I have export data to your application. So the difference is that the deploy database of SQL Azure is just a one, one shot. It creates a, it creates a temporary uh, backpack file and deploys this database to SQL Azure. It, it will, this wizard will uh, actually create the database for me as well based on the, um, the backpack name. Right? It'll ask me what the, what, you know, it actually, it will ask me what, the, what I want the new database, but it'll create it for me. The export data to your application, I have two options. All right, this actually allows me to save the backpack, and I can either save it in two places. All right? So let me right, whoops, right mouse click again. Tasks, uh, export data to your application. All right? And I can do two things with this. This is really nice, as soon as the wizard comes up. I can save this file to local disk, or I can actually save this file to blob storage, Windows Azure blob storage. If I want to save it to disk, that means it's maybe I want to crack it open or maybe just work with it locally or um, do something really minor with it, right? It might be a smaller database. But the reason I want, would want to save to Windows Azure Blob Storage is because maybe it's a larger database and I don't want to have to keep pulling that up from my local disk to create databases. Let me pull it from Blob Storage, right? And so that way I'm not, you know, going across the wire and have all that latency, right? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to save this to blob storage. So let me go into my management portal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Storage, let me go into my West US. That one. And I'm going to grab my keys. So I'm going to grab my name. So let me, uh, storage account connect that and the key. Let me grab the key. So let me copy the key. Paste that in, connect, okay? And I'm going to put this in the uh, backpack container. And it's basically going to be, going to co be called that. So it's going to create a temporary file name to create the backpack, but then it's going to save this into blob storage. So we'll click next. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm, I want to overwrite that. Click finish. All right, and notice what it's doing is now is it's basically creating this backpack with schema and data. And this, it's not a very big database, so it shouldn't take that long. Right? It's also validating. Yes. It's all, well, 
uh, it's, yes, it's also validating. What it will do is it on-prem and actually does a deeper, a, a good validation because it says, uh, is this database ready to migrate to Windows Azure SQL database, right? So if we were to try to do this with the AdventureWorks database, it would fail miserably because there's things that aren't, you know, in that database that aren't supported in Windows Azure SQL database. Okay, almost done. And then we have things like, once this is done, all done, right? So that didn't take that long. So now I have in my blob storage account, da -da -da, I go into containers, into backpack, right, there it is, right, 628, so there, or 625, right, so there's the backpack. So now what I can do is I can actually download this blob file locally and import it into my on-prem instance, or if I want to create a, a new database, I can go back to, you know, in the cloud, I can go back to servers, or actually I can do it right from here and say import, right, and so I want to, um, Yep, click on backpack. I want to go into West. Go into backpack. I want that one. Uh, let's call this Northwind 2. I want to choose my West US. Uh, let me connect. Okay. Why do I want to? Uh, why do I want to pick? Just pop quiz. So my uh, storage account is is uh, in West US, and my data, my server is in West US. Why is that important? Uh, latency, that's good, and? Cost, right? Anytime data leaves a data center, there's a cost associated with that, right? I can upload terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data all day long, that's free. And as long as data stays within the same data center, like it is here, so I'm only basically going, I'm taking you know, uh, from a, a blob storage to a database in the same data center, that's free. But if I'm taking from a storage account in one data center to a database in another data center, I have a cost so associated with that because I have data leaving that data center. Now, it's pennies on the dollars, like, you know, nine, ten cents per gigabyte. But if you're not careful, that stuff could add up. Okay? So at that point, let me click OK. All right, and now I've got a new database. All right, so this is from a DBA perspective. This is great. Now I can migrate uh, from on-prem very easily to the cloud. And this is important as to, I'm sure more, a lot of you have a software development lifecycle as to, you know, on-prem. So you need to think about how do I use these things uh, from a, a software development lifecycle in the cloud, All right? And that's, you know, up to you. But here's the tools to allow, you know, if I need to upgrade, uh, upgrade a database or, you know, I'm developing on-prem and I need to migrate my changes to the cloud, or even if I'm developing in the cloud from a, like this gentleman, I'm going from dev to production, how do I do that? How do I migrate these changes? Things like that, right? So things that, as a DBA, these are things to keep in mind. Okay? Any questions? And it's... It's done. It's done. Right? So, ta-da. So if I, I now should have a, what do I call it? Northwind 2. Northwind 2. Northwind 2, West US. Awesome. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, great. Let's turn to Tom. I think it's your turn. I get to talk now? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. To SQL Azure, yep. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, so I have, so I had a connection to Windows Azure SQL database. Yeah, so those are actual live databases in the cloud, yes. Well, so the reason we did it from the cloud, because, uh, so it's... <laughs> there, your, your local instance was... It's because my, the only reason we showed that is because my local instance was corrupt, right? Because, let me just jump out here real quick. Right, this is my local instance, but if I were, uh, the reason we did this is because my local instance has an issue. And, um, full log. Uh, uh, yeah, full log. Yeah. Uh, yes. It'll basically deploy that database to the same, to the same server in Windows Azure SQL database. 
Yeah, well, uh, so I'd give it another name. So basically, I'd now have a second database, uh, is that right? Uh, really, I would use that option, deploy database to SQL Azure from my on-prem, right? Yeah, so and I apologize, I didn't mean to confuse anybody. But it does give the ability to say, look, if I want to make a copy of my cloud database, great, let me, let me use this deploy database to SQL Azure scenario, right? I also have the ability, and Tom's going to show this in a minute, uh, copy database feature in T-SQL, he'll show that. Really, I would use the uh, copy database to SQL, deploy database to SQL Azure from on-prem, right? So, because one stop. But one last point is that I, I'm connected to the cloud, the management studio right here. I have the option to deploy because I can deploy to a different I instance, right? So from within management studio, if I had something on one Azure database, right, and I wanted to move it somewhere else, I could do that within management studio. Right, I don't have to go over to the portals. Right, again, yeah, if I've got a, you know, if I want to deploy to a database in a different data center, I could do that from cloud right. to cloud, right? Yeah, so if I do deploy, there's no intermediate step of going to, um, the, the, the difference is, is that it doesn't give me, like the, the export gives me the, uh, retains the artifact, the backpack. Deploy does not. Right? So deploy just says, I want to make a copy, just copy my database, either from on-prem or to the cloud, or from cloud to cloud, from one data center to another data center. But it does the same thing in the background. It does the same thing in the, it's the same process in the background. So deploy and export is the same background process. It creates a backpack, same backpack artifact. If I want to keep that artifact around, I would use export and just either put it on-prem, you know, store or in blob storage. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to talk about some maintenance. Then we're going to finish up talking about some uh, common errors and troubleshooting. Because if you're going to be moving to being a Windows Azure SQL Database DBA, you're going to want to know some of the things that you're probably going to have your users stumble upon. Uh, and then we'll finish with some best, general best practices. So general maintenance. This is usually one of the stumbling blocks for people when they think of Azure and they think in terms of uh, being a DBA. The thing about, and I try to tell people, is that you have less options in Azure, and that's a good thing, right? So if you have to do certain things in, uh, in an on-premise version of SQL Server, there's, I don't know, a thousand or a million different options, a whole bunch of different buttons and knobs to press and pull in order to make things work. In Azure, you actually have fewer options, so there's fewer things to check on. But one of the options you don't get in Azure is actually a backup command. And for some people, that's a huge stumbling block. And I get that. If you have a system that needs to be backed up every 10 minutes, then it's probably not the right thing for you to be thinking about migrating to Azure. That's fine. Lots of people, you don't really need a backup that frequently. Lots of systems, actually, you might only back up once a week. There's still no backup command available for you. But in Azure, what you would do is you're going to create a copy of a database, and then you would, use, uh, you would export that to a backpack. And now the reason you're going to use a database copy command for a backup is simply because that allows you to have transactional consistency. Because that is what the backup command on-prem does for you. It gives you a transactionally consistent view of your data. If you just do an export of an Azure SQL database, you don't end up with something that is transactionally consistent, right? Unless you know that nobody's connected to it and using it. That's the only way to know. So, but if you do a database copy, then you do get a backup. So some people will say, hey, there are no backups in Azure. Technically, the backup command's not there. If you need a copy of your database, you can get it. Now, I, I, but I do tell people, if you, it's really not meant, if you do have a system right now, like I say, transactional log backups every 15 minutes, then that system really isn't meant for Azure. Right? Not yet, right, not yet. But, so you have, we've already seen the import and export service, um, and we're gonna, I'll show you an example of a database copy. So, and, and it's really easy to move your data between uh, on-prem and the cloud and within the cloud as well. Uh, we've actually talked a little bit about that. So indexes. It, you are still using SQL Server. That's an important thing to understand. It's just a different version. It still has indexes. Indexes still get fragmented. Whatever solution you're using today to go and check for fragmentation on tables, anybody here using, say, PowerShell scripts for this? Maybe one guy? Right. Those are the same things you will do for your Windows Azure SQL database. You will want to check for index fragmentation. You will want to rebuild or reorganize as you see fit. They are DMOs in order, uh, there are DMOs available for you to find out the level of fragmentation. Um, 
what else did I want to mentor here? Alter index online. There was one other thing. I don't know if you talk about it tomorrow. I don't think you do. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's that. Yeah, Online, so you want to rebuild your, your indexes online, but my point uh, that we found is that if you have a really big table, so say you have a Windows Azure SQL database, uh, your limit is 150 gigs, but let's say you have a database that is uh, roughly that size, but you have a table in there that's about 100 gigs in size. If you, and it's a cluster index. If you want to rebuild that, you're probably, even online, you're probably going to use up more than five gigs of tempdb space, and it's possible you'll hit an error because you get throttled. If one session tries to uh, use too much tempdb space, it actually gets throttled. So something to be aware of when you're doing your index uh, fragmentation. If you have something, and I don't know what the exact number is, let's just say if you have a table, cluster index, uh, 100 gig in size, it's possible that you could come across an error when you try to rebuild that index. Right. So something to be aware of. Uh, stats. Uh, again, it's a version of SQL Server. You, you're, SQL Server, the optimizer works, it's based upon statistics. If you're not going in and making sure your statistics are up to date, uh, the auto, uh, auto create and update stats is on by default, yep. but that isn't always uh, a perfect thing, right? It, every now and then, your stats get out of date and you need to go in there manually and update them. So, uh, funny note is that there's only one DBCC command available in Windows Azure SQL database. You can't run CheckDB, you can't do anything else. The only one thing you can do is the show statistics DBCC command. And the reason for that, I believe, is in order to support distributed queries and to have somebody remotely be able to see the stats in order for a proper query plan to be built for optimization. So once they turned that on last year, they actually enabled the show statistics. So it's a version of SQL Server. CheckDB's there. I imagine it's being run for you in the background. Some things are automatically being done. Some things are being automatically done for you. Remember, less maintenance. It's less maintenance. Right? For you. You don't have to worry about running the CheckDB. You can't run CheckDB because if you and everybody else are using that actual server, you might bring that down if you all decide to run it at the same time. Same reason you're not going to get the backup command. If you all kick off your backups at the same time of day, you could negatively impact other users of the system. So, certain things uh, are out of your control, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, let's look at a uh, quick. Uh, and I think I can use your mouse now. <laughs> mouse is a very personal thing. I have to get used to using yours, so we're not connected. Yep, and we might want to change that because we've already got AW copy. So maybe AW copy two. Sure, sure, sure. So what I'm going to do here, real quick, is I'm going to run a uh, command, the create database, and we're going to name it AW copy two as a copy of the AdventureWorks 2012 database. All right? Very simple command. This is going to get me the backup. This is going to give me a transactionally consistent view of that database. So if somebody's hitting AdventureWorks 2012 right now in that instance, it's fine, doesn't matter to me, I can get my backup. So we'll run that. All right. You, good sir, are going to need to put in a password. For nope, me. I can do that. Yeah, why don't you do that and use your mouse. <laughs> I'm going to use my mouse to do that. Yeah. Is I that just, all right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So now that is going to kick off. Now, if you are using, well, you'll note right here is that actually, if I was to refresh, you're going to see that it actually shows up as AW as, as copy two, but, ah. Inside of this view, the DM database copies, you see I have a row there. Start date, end date, percent complete. So if you are going to be using Windows Azure SQL database and you're going to be using the database copy command, you're going to have to pay attention inside and see what's the status of that copy. So just because the database gets listed doesn't mean it, it's actually done yet. It's not instantaneous. So say if it's uh, your weekly backup that you're doing as part of your process, you're probably going to want to kick off the, your copies, then you're probably going to want to check that DMV until all rows are gone. And then once all rows are gone, all the copies must be done. Because that you're only getting one row in there for each di copy that's in progress. So let me, let's just state that you notice that there is a um, percent complete. Percent complete. So for smaller databases, it really just you know it, what it did is it kicked off a job, and the copy doesn't really take that long. So the percent complete really you're just looking to see if 
is this row yeah. there or not? It, that null right now just tells me that the job hasn't started. AdventureWorks is not that big, what, 200 megs? Yeah, uh, if that. It's, it's a fairly small database that we have up there on, on that instance. So that just tells me that we have a job scheduled somewhere, eventually it'll get done. Right. It just, it hasn't even started yet. And then, but it'll be so fast that it'll go 100% right. right. done. Right. Now if you're doing a 10 or 15, 20, 50 gig database, then you'll notice a percent complete. Right, but at that point, just look for, to see if that row's still there, like Tom said. So do they use SQL Agent for this? Because uh, we know it's a job somewhere, but I've never really asked them the question. Yeah, that's a good question, I don't know. All right, it's a good question, because we don't have an answer. Great question we have slides for. Good question we don't have an answer for. And so this isn't done yet? No, nah, it'll finish eventually. So what happens if I go here right now, and I'm just curious, can I query this? <coughs> like I, are the tables there? Tables aren't there yet either. Just the database. It's been provisioned by name only, but the data isn't there yet. The copy's not done. So, something to keep in mind. Twenty minutes. Good. Twenty-four. Okay. okay. Uh, questions about database copy? All right. So, monitoring, tuning, troubleshooting. Uh, the next section is based upon a lot of information that Microsoft has gathered over, uh, let's say, the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, the feedback from the customers currently using Windows Azure SQL Database and the common issues they've seen. So again, if you're going to start administering these things, these are likely going to be the same things you're going to be seeing, and people are going to be coming to you for answers. So I want to make sure that you understand what's happening. So connectivity. What? The trouble with being on the, cl on the cloud help desk is you just can't people try to reboot it. Hey, you can't? I can't call Microsoft <laughs> and say fix this? No? Connectivity. Connectivity is the number one issue when it comes to uh, Azure SQL Database, flat out. And it's one, uh, a, another stumbling block for some people where they complain that they are not always connected. And you're not. Most apps and things that we use these days, we kind of learn to accept that you may not always be connected. Uh, maybe even five or six years ago, though, that really wasn't the case. People just kind of demanded things to always be connected. Uh, there's three general buckets for connectivity issues. WASI errors, general errors, loss of connection. I'm going to walk through each one of those. So why does my connection fail? Four reasons, four buckets for, for why connections in general ha have failed. Uh, one is a firewall rule. Now, and these all have very specific error messages, right? So one will be a firewall rule, another will be authentication. Authentication will say, you know, login failed. So login failed, of course, that's a pretty specific message. Again, though, you may find your users calling and complaining and saying there's something wrong with the cloud, all right? Why is my login failing? Uh, you're probably putting in the wrong password, most likely. Uh, invalid logins, denial, um, denial of service. So you can flood, mm -hmm. yeah, you can flood the uh, instance of Azure SQL database, it'll throttle and it'll shut yep. down. So is that a specific error message? Yeah, oh yeah, if you yeah, get, yeah. so if you're getting, th yeah, oh yeah. You'll, yeah, be. yeah. You, you'll get another specific error message for, for why that is, uh, in particular, is failing. So some of the other examples are uh, server not found. Again, somebody types in the wrong server name. If you've seen those logical server names, it's real easy to transpose a couple of letters. They try to type something in, they say, hey, server not found. However, server not found, could also be the result of a failover. So one of the great things about you know, Windows Azure SQL Database is that it's, it's really designed for something that needs high availability. High availability comes with failovers. That's how it works. You have something here, and now I'm gonna move it and you're gonna go there. It's a chance that you could drop a connection. You may not always be connected. So it could be the chance that you go and you push a button, you try to connect, and it says server not found. And you have put in everything correctly, but you still can't find that server, because that server isn't there right now. You need to wait for it to have be failed over. It's possible. Uh, semaphore timeouts, network latency, these are all uh, issues. I thought it was funny, Bob Ward was on the train between London and Nottingham, and he was trying to use their Wi-Fi, and he was getting uh, latency issues, and he was showing us the error message. Here's an example. Of course, you wouldn't really expect that while you're on the train, you're going to be able to connect up to your instance of Azure SQL Database through, through the train Wi-Fi. But he knew that he could generate a few errors to, to show us, so I thought that was interesting. Um, loss of connection, uh, as I mentioned, failover. 
idle connections. Uh, what you just saw was I got prompted in for, uh, to log in for his instance. Uh, we were logged in. We got kicked off because we were idle for more than 30 minutes yeah, or something. So, yeah, 30 minutes. So it, it could be the case that somebody comes in. If you've ever seen it in Management Studio, you get that uh, two-line error that says general, I couldn't connect or something. And you just hit execute again, and you get reconnected, and the query runs. Same thing. So retry logic. Uh, this is an area of programming that I think has, uh, where I say everything old is new again. Many years ago, you did not assume that you were always connected to your data. So you had retry logic into your apps. And I think about 13, 14 years ago with .NET, it became really easy for you to build an application. Uh, and one of the first things you would do is you open the connection, you'd fill your record set and, or data set or data readers at some point, right? Uh, so you just always assumed that you were connected. Once you made that initial connection in the application, you just always assumed it was. They even have connection pooling. Mm -hmm. You just always assumed it, and you, we just forgot that we ever might need to retry that. And if a connection failed, and I've seen this a lot of time, I was a production DBA for seven years, lots of times things failed because a, a, con, a connection failed. There was never really any retry logic in, built into a lot of these applications. If you go to Azure, you have to have retry logic. You just can't. They have a white paper, uh, I believe now, yep. that details how to build an application that will use a Windows Azure SQL database backend. You have to build it with the idea that retry logic is just absolutely needed. It's an old programming technique uh, that for some reason, I guess, uh, in general, we've kind of forgotten about. But what we're finding is that not just everything old is new again, but um, it was a best practice that was kind of lost for a while. It's still a best practice, and it's becoming more in fashion these days. So troubleshooting connectivity. Uh, the current, the error message says the current IP address is not included in the existing firewall rules. Again, a very specific error message, right? And you probably know how to go and fix that. You're going to see uh, very specific messages from uh, Windows Azure SQL Database. As a matter of fact, if you are so inclined, if you go to SQL Server 2012 and you go to Sys Messages and you look in the 40,000 range, you will get a list of messages that are Azure SQL Database specific. So if you're curious about some of the things that maybe we don't know about yet, uh, that's how I found the, um, uh, I don't know if it's in here, it's one million locks. If you have a thread that has a million locks or, um, yeah, is it a million locks? There's a million. It's a million yeah. locks. It's pretty high. So, something high like that. I'm like, really? So if one, if one session actually consumes over a million locks, it gets throttled. And, and I wouldn't have known that, except I'm fooling around in sys messages, and I just see these things, and I go, well, that's kind of cool. But who would ever have a million locks? <laughs> so he, some of the and standard... don't raise your hand if you do. Don't we don't want to know. <laughs> So some of the standard, the ping, telnet, and trace route. So in New Orleans, when we were trying to do our pre-con, we showed up, we actually couldn't connect to the cloud. Kind of a big thing if you're doing a pre-con on cloud, right? And uh, what we found was, and we only needed those three tools. It was like, well, can we ping? Actually, if you try to ping your uh, cloud, the logical name, you won't get a reply back. It's, it's silent, right? It's, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't respond to ping requests. If I ping the IP address, I will get a response back that the IP is there, okay? Uh, telnet, if you telnet to the port 1433, you should get back a blank screen if you've successfully telnet. If you can't successfully telnet, then you've got an issue. Some, most likely something's being blocked, uh, likely at the router level. That's what was happening in New Orleans. Traceroute was another interesting one for me, because when I was doing the traceroute, they were able to see the activity, and all of a sudden it just died somewhere. And it helped the network guys at that point, between telnet and traceroute, the network guys, instead of saying, we're not blocking anything, uh, it's not us, it's not us. Once they started seeing that information, they go, yeah, we agree, there is something wrong here. And then they went and figured it out. And it was one router in the convention center that was blocking 1433. And once they found it and they fixed it, the show could go on, as they would say. So general connection errors, without a doubt, have been the number one thing that uh, users end up being focused on. And I actually, uh, I'm not sure that's all that much different than, than the world of today. Right? If you can't connect or if you get a uh, drop connection in the middle of things, that ends up being a, a headache even today. So now the other bucket is actual uh, Azure SQL Database errors because it's, it's a machine. There can be errors on their end. So uh, I, I have failover listed, but I, I don't count, uh, I'm sorry, a failover as uh, an error because I believe that's the way it's supposed to work. Yep. 
uh, but you might see an error message as a result of failover. Uh, quota is another one. So uh, if I provision the database for one gig, I can actually shove two gigs of data in there, but I won't be able to use it until I, t until I expand the database or I set the max size to be something bigger. I'll get back an error message that says my quota has been exceeded. So Azure's, Azure's great. They let all the data in, but it, <laughs> it costs to get it back out. That's, that's nice, right? He's, he doesn't uh, find this funny. Yeah, yeah. Y you can get all the data you want into the cloud. It's just getting it out is where you see the error messages. You don't get an error for Put inserting. It in. okay. Yeah, I, no, because that's what happened to us in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Throttling, uh, we'll talk about in a second. Things that are not supported, Windows Azure SQL Database is simply a different version of SQL Database. Some commands are just not supported, like backup, right? So you might find those messages and your end users might get that message and then come to you and say, why can't I issue, why can't I run DBC CheckDB against this database? Because it's an Azure database, that's why. Uh, and database copy, we'll talk about all these. Uh, again, failover. Instances get moved. It's a highly available system. Instances get moved sometimes. You will get message 4197 that says server not available if the server is not available. And that's why retry logic must be present. Quota. So some of the reasons that you can hit the quota, max worker threads per instance, right? Uh, there's actually two different messages, 928, 929. One of them is hard and soft throttling. We'll talk about that in a second. The max database size I just mentioned, and that's message 4544. So which one's hard? I think soft is 928. Yes, yeah. Uh, so message 10928 means that you have done something that affects you. Essentially, that's a soft throttle. That means that for your logical unit, right, something has happened and your session is being throttled, okay? So, uh, for example, the million locks. Do I, do I have that? No, I don't mm -mm. think. So there's a, I, maybe I do later. There are examples for where you've done something that affects you and you're being throttled. Okay, 929 is a hard throttle. That means you have a noisy neighbor or something has happened on the instance where all these people are using or have databases stored. So um, perhaps, oh, who knows what. Uh, what oh, for hard throttling? throttling? Yeah, for hard throttling. Um, DOS, yeah. denial service. So hard throttling can happen. So more that, that's essentially, what happens is there's this watchdog service that's running on these servers. And it says, all right, you're using t up too much, but it's only affecting you. I'm going to throttle just you. But if what you use up ends up affecting everyone else, then becomes a hard throttle message yeah. for others, right? So that's the difference, 928, 929. If you see 929, and the reason I point this out, if you see message 929, there may not be a whole lot you can do about it. That, that really is something outside your control and it's affecting everyone. If yeah, you see 928, there's a good chance you can fix it. Max connections is a good example of. Right, max connections. Right. You only get 180? Yeah, 180 max connections. And this is why we you know, use connection pooling, yeah. right? Because that way you won't, you, don't, you won't hit the max connection issue. Uh, throttling, I, I just mentioned, the watchdog service, session killed with explanation. Uh, you can get information out of the sys.event log, and, and we're going to see that in, in a little bit. Uh, oh, I did. I put some up here. I'm not sure you can see that. Let me see. Session blocking a system task. These are the ones I pulled out of the sys.messages. I knew I had a slide for this. Uh, the sys.messages table that I found interesting. A session blocking a system task for a long period of time, 20 seconds. You will get throttled. That, and you'll get message 928. Hey, this is what's happening. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll get error 4549. Um, session consuming too many locks. Session consuming too much temp DB space. We actually already talked about that. Transaction consuming too much log space or active transaction preventing long truncation. So alter index, again, uh, if you're doing something in one big long transaction, you can get an error message. Consuming too much memory, 16 megs. So if you have a session that has a really big plan, I guess, uh, or there are memory weights of 20 seconds, you can find yourself being throttled. There's the not supported. We mentioned DBCC, not every command, only show statistics. There's only one alter database command that's allowed. Uh, you can't do alter database for anything else. You get no options in Azure. The only option you get is to pay more. So alter database set max size and increasing the size of the database is the only alter database command that is allowed. You can't do a use database. Uh, and it just dawned on me recently, I, I've always just accepted you can't do a use database, but it finally hit me. You can't do a use database because you can't go from this database to that database. They're probably on two different servers, and they have no idea about each other. 
So the use database command simply isn't supported. That's either. exactly, and that's exactly why. Right, you can't, they don't know where it is. Yeah. Right. They're on physical different servers, so database A doesn't know about database B. And your server scope DMOs, you don't get those either. You don't get to see the information on the instance, because all you get to see is information about your database that's on that instance, which really is fair. But you can't, if you're used to doing a lot of server level uh, diagnostics, you can't get that out of Azure, because there's no, you can get some, but you can't get all of them. So a lot of server scope DMOs, just simply not available. You have to think of things in terms of database. So performance monitoring, troubleshooting, uh, some of the basics, we'll get through this and then we'll do some best practices and we'll have time for questions. Uh, so the basics, running, blocking, the, the basics for performance monitoring that you do today still exist in Azure. Are things currently running, things being blocking? Have this plan changed? Code. Code, I would, I would argue that code is one of the biggest performance problems that all of us face. When it comes to there being an issue, I, I tell people good database performance starts with good database design. If you have a badly designed database and then you put bad code on top of it, we end up doing things, uh, all those other knobs I've talked about earlier, that's just to cover up bad design and bad code. And at some point, that also fails. You only have so much limit on hardware and things that you can do. So uh, the basics still apply in Azure, right? You've got to have good code, same as before. Uh, I'm sorry, indexes, stats, network latency, another big one. So the performance scenarios that, um, and we got this from, from Bob Ward that they're seeing. Uh, as he put it, he said they had some stuff that was unexpected, then they see a lot of query timeouts, and then there's CPU and I.O. Uh, so the unexpected stuff was seeing, uh, if you go in, you can view the weights for your particular database, uh, your logical, your, yeah, so for your instance of Azure SQL database, you'll see things like uh, lots, if you have a lot of small transactions, you'll see a lot of write log weights. But then they have these things, SE repl star. That's the replication. So your instance of Azure SQL database has two copies, right? So every time you do a transaction, it has to wait for two copies to be synchronized and come back. And that ends up being those SE REPL weights. And if you see a high amount of occurrences of those, you may want to call Microsoft and say, why is it that the replication for those copies is taking such a long time? Because it all should be in the same, has to be in the same data center. Yes. So, uh, and deadlocks. And I can, uh, if we have time, we can look at some deadlocks. Um, actually, I don't know if you generated any, but I can no. show you where it would be. Uh, so these are some of the unexpected performance issues that they were getting from customers. And uh, these days you can actually get the deadlock information a lot easier out of Azure because it's a result of customers saying, I need to be able to see deadlocks and you aren't letting me do profiler or extended events. So they've built a way to get the deadlock information into Azure SQL database because customers are seeing that. Uh, query timeouts, blocking is usually the number one, but you know, query plans change. Uh, he, Bob has application trace the query, so tracer tokens mm -hmm. is what he's really talking about there, because you can't run trace, so that can be confusing. Uh, CPU and I.O., there's no specific restrictions. You're not, th you're not restricted to certain CPU and I.O., you're, you're not. But throttling could occur if you take up too much, okay? So these are the DMVs that we use uh, for performance monitoring. It's very similar to the ones you have right now, except for the fourth one. DMDB weight stats. That's database level weight information. And it's something I really hope they get into the box product as well. Uh, a lot of times you can be in Azure and you can see things that are new and shiny, and they actually do make it into a version of the box products within a year or 18 months. It's kind of cool. I almost, I joke and I call Azure kind of like a sandbox for a lot of the dev team at, at Microsoft. They get to see if something works and if it's useful and it has value. Um, there are also the missing index DMOs, same as today, I would tell you. Don't just simply take their advice and deploy what they say. You know, create in, or missing index hints. You should create this non-cluster index or whatever. You don't just blindly take it, but they still exist for you there. You should do what you're doing today, which is look at it, review it, see if the index makes sense. Uh, but so a lot of the similar, you know, DM exec query plan, query stats, and exec requests, they exist. You can use them just as you're using them now. Some example of the weight types. Uh, that we had mentioned, so write log, so an SE, REPL, commit, acknowledgement. Uh, the async network IO is up there as well. So just an example, if you were to go and look at the weights for your database here, this is an example of what you'd see. And I tell people, 
Uh, I point out you want to look at the actual count and then the wait time total in order to figure out your average. So write log had a max wait time of 356 milliseconds, which I think is fairly high. But that was a max. That was one max out of 522,000, right? So which one took a long time? I, I don't know which one exactly took 356, but I know if I divide the uh, wait time by waiting task count, I can figure out the average. And I see signal wait time is just waiting on CPU. So it looks like this box is, I think most boxes, CPU stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we can uh, look real quick. Um, yeah, might as well. Just those two queries? Yeah, yeah, just those two queries. Let me get it here. Uh, yep, that one. Yeah. So, uh, so the sys event log, yeah, it is. Transport level error. Oh, let me just click on it again, and then we'll come back. Um, we'll zoom. So I get some information here. Uh, I see database name, start name, start time and end time. It's always a five-minute increment. I see category, event type. I get some nice information here in the sys.event log for what's happening on my particular instance. What's more important is that if I do have deadlocks, this additional data column that says right now everything is null, if there is a deadlock, it does get logged in here, and the deadlock XML shows up in that null column. You click on it, you can review the XML. If you then save that file, right, you save it as an XDL and reopen it, you actually get the XML show plan graph. All right, so it's really cool. It's really easy to get the information. Um, so this table can give me a lot of good details about what's happening on my system. So if somebody's complaining and saying, hey, why did, uh, you know, where are the errors or something happened last night, can you go in and look? I can get details about the events that are happening for my particular instance. I can also get information about connection stats. So I, even myself as a DBA way back when, I wanted the details about, um, how my systems were being used, how many people were connected at different times of day, things like that. That's actually a feature that's built into Windows Azure SQL database. So if you're that type of person that you want to be tracking the usage over time, how busy people are, I always think of this in terms of billing. So if I need to know, you know, who is using the system the most, I can get that type of information right out of the DMVs. There's a lot of other useful DMVs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we're getting close to the end here that you should uh, poke around it. There's, I would say this is that the documentation for Azure is, uh, is well done, in my opinion. And you can get a lot of the information out of the Azure documentation to find uh, useful queries, useful DMVs to be using. All right, best practices. Uh, warning. So I know uh, people get hung up on the backups, and I find it funny because I, I mentioned that Azure is something built for high availability, and people always want to talk about DR and they think of it as a, a shortcoming, and I go, but, or uh, if I tell them that they need to do, you need to create a copy, and if you need the DR solution, you need a backup. The only way to have a backup is if you have a copy, and people groan, they go, so I have to manage all that? And I kind of laugh, and I go, but you manage that yourself already today, so what's the difference? You're already doing backups, you're already managing your own DR uh, solution. You have to do the same thing in Azure, you just have to do it differently, but it has to be done. If you have to have DR for the solution you're putting to the cloud, and most people do, you're going to need to be taking your own copies of that database. Uh, cluster indexes are required. However, uh, they're only required for you to actually use it. I can create a table in Azure without a cluster index, but I can't do anything with it. I can't load data. I can't, you know. So you have to have a cluster index for every table. You will want to rebuild your indexes online. You will want to uh, change max size disconnects. But I told people, if I'm actively doing work, in a database, it doesn't just drop my connection, it lets me finish my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, alter database to change the max size will disconnect people. So if you have to go in and do, it, so if somebody was connected but they're not, connected but not doing, uh, not submitting a request, they will get disconnected. Let me just say something about that really quick. You yeah. don't want to wait until you get to the max size, right? You can programmatically determine, you don't want to get to that point. You, you can could. write something to programmatically say, I'm getting close, let me do this off offline. You could. Uh, DMVs are database scope, that's uh, another thing to, uh, understand or wrap your head around a little bit is that you've got to focus on things that are, are scoped just for your database. And data time is UTC, UTC, which for most people in Europe is never an issue. For anybody in the US, we, this concept of UTC just escapes us, I guess. Um, I, I, I don't know what to tell you about that, but 
Uh, everybody in New Orleans is like, oh, it's UTC only? Really? That's all we get? And yes, and you can't change the server time. Don't call Microsoft and say, can you please make my server east, eastern time zone? The answer is no. You get UTC and you learn to adapt. Like I said, everybody in Europe, though, they're like, yeah, of course yeah. it's UTC. <laughs> yeah. What, what else, else would you, you use? Yeah. Yeah, what else would you use? Exactly. Uh, troubleshooting checklist. Uh, there is a Windows Azure portal. Uh, there's a dashboard posting for an outage. So if you can go to these pages and they will tell you right now, they will show you all of the data centers and the, all green or if there's an issue or right, right. So if you're having an issue with your instance, one thing you might want to do is go and check some of the information that the Azure team has out there because maybe your data center is down right now. It, something could be affecting that data center. So Microsoft sometimes will start pointing you and say, yeah, you called us, but it looks like your data center's down. By the way, here's a link. You could check that for yourself without having to contact us. Uh, so Windows Azure portal, SQL management portal, two different ways for you to try to connect and try to figure out what's going on. If you can't connect, it helps you troubleshooting as well. General connectivity, internet provider issues. If you're like me, you've tried to connect uh, to Azure, say, from a hotel room, and you find out that the hotel, either the ISP that they use blocks 1433, or the hotel is blocking 1433, just as a standard uh, precaution, right? Well, uh, there's not a lot you can do about that from that hotel at that moment. Uh, firewall configurations is another one. Uh, all, all good things that if somebody's having issues using Windows Azure SQL Database, six good things for you to kind of uh, walk through. Uh, final thoughts, and then some references, yeah. Monitoring application, oh, we're over time. Monitor applications, databases, and co connectivity, errors outside of the app boundary. What does that really mean? <laughs> uh, um, so something that isn't your app specific, but something that affects Azure, like at um, a data center level. Thing, things are outside your app. Okay. And designing for Windows Azure apps. All right. Yep. Final thoughts. And this, we have some references. Yep. Uh, is this related content? Is this, this isn't from New yeah. or this is from New Orleans, so I don't yeah, know if these matter. Well, yeah, so we are doing the DBA journey from on-premise to the cloud. Uh, we are doing the query performance and tuning techniques, so this does apply. So this is the one we're doing tomorrow. But um, there is no book signing. But he, he can be in the exhibition hall if you want, and he can give you an autograph. Yeah. <laughs> so right. related content, uh, you guys good. will have the slides. Yeah. Where, so where we will, uh, the slides will be available. Anyway, yeah, we're over time. Yeah, we have links available for you as well. That's all I want to show. We are over time, but happy to stick around and answer any questions. So, anyway, thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll be here.